Ashley, thank you so much for this opportunity to talk to you about you and your life in the Hamptons and your businesses. Well, it's exciting to be here in kind of my second home, the Spur, and uh, great to be here on, as part of this program. So thank you. So let's start with what you've done in your past, sort of the short life business story of, of you, what you've done before you came to the Hamptons. Uh, well, I'm originally from England. Hopefully you can tell just about still by the accent. I moved here in 2001, uh, really to become an entrepreneur. Uh, I did a lot of corporate business. Uh, I did an economics degree. I worked as a management consultant. I had a pretty kind of traditional career path, as it were, going on in London. Um, but when the 99, 2000 kind of wave started of all that tech startup uh, lifestyle over here in the States, um, I'd visited, kind of fell in love with that concept uh, and wanted to, to, to be part of it. So I essentially moved here. I didn't have a job. I didn't have any exact idea or business I was involved in. I just knew I needed to be, to be in New York and be in that scene. And so a uh, week before September 11th, I got mm -hmm. on a plane uh, and arrived full time with my bag and uh, a little, uh, little bag of cash that I cashed out my bank account and, and was ready to kind of start my next life. And then September 11th happened uh, a week later mm -hmm. and I had a big decision to make, which is do I stay or do I go? Uh, I chose to stay, um, kind of lived through that experience. I, it kind of connected me to the city even more than, than previously. Mm -hmm. um, seeing the outpouring of love and support and, and the city kind of rally around that, that, that incredible day. Um, and it was actually a great time to kind of be a thinker and, 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 and start an entrepreneurial journey because there was time because everything was kind of on pause at that time. I don't know if you remember or the audience remembers, yeah. but 9-11, it was sort of everybody just sort of started taking a stock and everything slowed down a little bit. And um, uh, also there were a lot of people who were made, uh, who, who either lost their jobs or, or people in transition. And so it was a great time to appeal to other people to join a new idea and, and, and sort of this rebirth of something. Um, and so the business I started that uh, sort of morphed into what's known as Shazam now um, was a concept where you could use your cell phone to identify music uh, and then drive you into a record store to actually purchase the CD because back then in 2001 people were still buying CDs, there was no iTunes, there were no apps on phones. Uh, so we launched this service called Music Cube. It was a 1-800 number. It sent you a text message, and then you could go into a record store and log out uh, an iPack, which is kind of what an iPhone is today, an iPack uh, with, a, with a, a scanner on it, and you could walk around the store, scan any CD, listen to it, purchase it, um, and it would remind you what tracks you'd listen to when you were out and about in cafes and bars or wherever it was that you were traveling on the radio. Um, and that was kind of the launch of my sort of entrepreneurial journey. Um, and so was heavily into technology, building out that platform, uh, raising money and that whole entrepreneurial kind of journey of uh, starting, starting from scratch and trying to create, create something. Um, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to pause you there. So, so of all, and I also share a, a 9-11 story. I actually was living in Taos, New Mexico during 9-11 and decided to come back to New York yep. after that happened and come back home. Yep. Um, of all the ideas that you could have chosen for this venture, how did you land on music? So music was a passion uh, anyway. I you know, kind of love music, live music. And for me, um, New York had a different music scene than London. So I'd come from a London experience and I came to New York and I was a, an adventurer and I was going to different places and I was hearing different music. Um, and so part of it was just that aha. I'd done a lot of mobile work in the UK and at the time, Europe was way ahead of the US in terms of sort of mobile technology because we had GSM versus CDMA and all the American technologies that were sort of disparate and slower. Um, and so I'd done some projects uh, and just come off a big project where we were doing location-based weather service. So the idea, which seems amazing you know, back then, about 99, 2000, where you could text in and it would tell you the weather for your location. Um, and that was done in the UK with Vodafone and the Met Office and I was leading that project. And so when I came here and I was hearing this music, I was thinking to myself, well, I know phones can do all these new interesting things. Uh, and that was my background. And here we've got this kind of new interesting music. How do we kind of connect in that aha moment of sort of that name that tune concept came up? Um, so I found a gentleman from MIT who was a very smart and savvy kind of developer and acoustic expert. And so together we sort of worked on, worked on it. So, you know, of all the ideas, 
it, it wasn't as my, my head had a thousand ideas in it and I had to pick from them. It was almost a journey that was sort of a path that was laid for me, if you will. And I just sort of followed, followed that path. And, and out of your uh, passion and out of your personal interest right. came. Yeah, I think this, that's, yeah, passion and personal interest exactly came this idea. Um, so. Yeah, I know a lot of our readers and viewers are sitting there thinking, you know, I want to have my own business, but what's yep. the idea? Yeah. Uh, so in that journey of building this company and then exiting from yep. the company, yep. tell us one story that is a highlight and yep. one story that is a challenging part of the journey. Um, well, I think, you know, a highlight for me was, uh, I, so, so there were two parts to that business. There was the mobile technology part where you were identifying music. And then there was the in-store component where you were walking into a music store and using our device to sample music and guide you around the store to make your purchase. Um, we were lucky enough to do a deal with Virgin, um, and so I got to spend some time with Richard Branson, the highlight of my, you know, kind of my entrepreneurial journey. Um, and uh, it was a funny story because we were at San Francisco. He was relaunching the Virgin store there, um, and our technology was integrated as part of the store relaunch, so I was there for that. Um, and we were waiting in the sort of the, the small VIP reception room. It was busy, lots of press, lots of people. I was there and everybody was waiting for Richard uh, to kind of come in. And he'd just flown in, I believe, from South Africa, uh, where he'd been doing some volunteer work and helping with some of his charities. And so he kind of arrived, he was a little bit late, uh, came into the room uh, and he grabbed one of these devices, uh, sort of a hand, this handheld kiosk that we had, uh, picked it up and said, oh, I've heard about this, so how does it work? And you know, I explained, well, you pick up a CD and you scan it, kind of like at the checkout, when you hit the button, a red laser appears and you scan the barcode and it registers and you can listen to music, it had headphones attached to it. So that was, kind of a, that was kind of a highlight. I also got to meet Bill Gates while I was at that company and on a private retreat and spend some time with him. Um, and so those were kind of two of my icons, sort of uh, Richard Branson and Bill Gates, who have very different personalities, very different, um, but obviously both have built iconic companies and done amazing things. Um, so I think, um, I guess the low light for me, um, or the stressful side is, is the entrepreneurial part, which is persuading people this will be a business, um, raising capital, um, you know, and, and working with others. So we went through some transitions, some growth and some decline. When the record stores started closing down about 2004, they, they had less budget. Whilst ours was an exciting product, they weren't investing anymore in the retail environments. And so I had to lay off probably 80% of my team. Um, and you know, that's a hard thing to do. Right. When people have joined you on this, this, this journey and passion, and you know, sure, people get paid, but nothing like really their probable worth. Yes. Um, and, and they've put their blood, sweat, and tears into, into this kind of business. And so walking into a room and, and essentially you know, saying, hey, we don't have money to pay you. Um, you know, some people stayed, some people didn't. You, know, you can't blame anybody for the choice in their personal circumstance. But, but doing that is, is, is a hard thing. And I think once you've gone through that experience, it really cements what it is to be an entrepreneur. Um, it's not just a ride of highs and highs and highs. There's a lot of lows and uh, you know, there's little highs keep you going, but every day you're, you're battling those, so. Yeah, I've also been on a corporate track and as an entrepreneur and I've had a lot of failures as an entrepreneur and I, I now wear them as badges of honor. Yeah. But when you're in it, it's very painful. Yeah, it is very painful. It's very painful, but you so. try to learn from them. You do. You know, those yeah. are the things that make you stronger. And, the, you know, it's a cliche, but um, if it doesn't kill you, it'll make you stronger. Or <laughs> it's a good it's one. A, it's a good one. Kelly so Clarkson. It's a good one. Every entrepreneur <laughs> needs to know that and needs to go through that experience. Yeah. Um, there's a lot of entrepreneurs that I've met who've had success after success, but then had a massive failure and can't deal with it because mm -hmm. they almost had it, I don't want to say too easy, but it whether it was luck or skill or timing, they sort of went from one to another um, and they didn't have yeah. you know, that failure. It just seemed easy. And then they yeah. question themselves, well, why and what did I do wrong? And, and it, 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 it's, it, it can it's, destroy it you. It can destroy you it if, it, if you go from a super high to that low. So yeah. for me, it was a little sort of baby steps. Yeah. Um, so. so what else have you done before you came to the Hamptons? So, um, so after doing that in a second company I was involved in, in a kind of similar field, which was instead of identifying music, it was identifying products that you saw in television shows. So it was sort of a pivot of that idea. Um, uh, and that failed in 2008 because of the market crash. Um, I started a technology and marketing agency um, called Dotbox with another partner. Um, and we were really focusing on helping brands and retailers 
Uh, we were based in New York City. Um, we'd done a lot of work on Facebook and those platforms in the early days, and so we're helping those brands and retailers leverage basically social media, social platforms to help build their business and brands. And this was way early, this is 2008, so 11 years ago. I mean, now it's commonplace, but back then it was very new. We were almost the first social, social commerce agency, we coined the phrase. Um, and so managed to build that company up. It wasn't, there was no funding, it was organic growth company. We didn't raise any money, um, which you can do from a service-based company to some degree. Mm -hmm. um, and then we end up building a platform, a technology platform. Um, which had some similarities to Shopify, which is now the big platform in this space. So again, we were very early, bleeding edge, as you will, um, and ran that for four years, grew it up. We had about 50 people in the team, and I was lucky enough to sell that company. And so we were acquired by a public holding company in the advertising space, um, and that allowed us to have some lifestyle flexibility for the first time, pay off some debts, um, and we purchased a house, a second home. We had two young children uh, in the city, uh, in a you know, very small apartment, as many people do, um, and so wanted to kind of invest in a property out here so that we could have some lifestyle time. Um, and so we, that's kind of started our journey. And we became the infamous weekenders where we would come most weekends out here, and I'd always feel this kind of breath of relief as I kind of drove up our, our street and left the city behind and um, was looking forward to kind of a relaxing time. Um, and so that was in 2012, um, we, we, we started that journey. Um, and then a little bit fast forward for, I wanted to start a company that was a little bit more giving back, mm -hmm. uh, having had been lucky enough to have a bit of a success. So I started a healthcare company focused on obesity and diabetes, uh, a lifestyle platform called Off The Scale, which helps people who are in those unfortunate circumstances to try and reprogram their life, their approach to food and exercise and, and themselves really. Um, because it's a, it's a national crisis, it's a global crisis, um, and we wanted to be part of a solution, part of a big problem, and help solve a, a big problem. Um, and so that business allowed me to spend some time in the city, some time out here in our home. Um, we have three kids at this point. They, they, they all went to the local school here, which is fabulous, at Southampton Elementary. Uh, 10, eight, and five. Two girls, Chloe, who's 10, Lola, who's eight, uh, almost nine, and Dash, Dashel, who's five. And um, what schools are they in? So uh, when we were in the city, we lived in the city, we were at a school called Avenues, which was a startup school itself, and we were attracted to that <laughs> because it was this new school, a new concept, um, and we had a great time there for a few years until we decided to move out here in 2014 full-time, um, and we chose to go to Southampton Elementary School, which is just you know, a half corner. a mile from here, around the corner, um, and haven't looked back. The kids have a wonderful great. time, and uh, it's a great, great. school. Great. Um, so. so how long have you lived full-time out here? Five years. Five years. And what are the great things about living and working in the Hamptons? Well, I think a lot of people who live in the city and spend time out here enjoy their time out here because of access to the lifestyle it provides, um, whether it's the beaches, the fresh air, the backyards. Um, and so being able to do that instead of just two days a week, being able to do it seven days a week or at least four or five because I was still in the city a bunch of, a bunch of my time. But um, I mean, that's one of the biggest benefits uh, personally is to have that ability to, to be a bit more relaxed. And I grew up in the countryside in England. Mm -hmm. I wasn't a city, I didn't grow up in London. I certainly moved there, but, but didn't grow up there. And so I guess part of that boyhood wanted to, to sort of have that, that backyard and, and have the kids run around and so forth. And so, um, so for me personally, that was, that was a good attraction and the ability still to spend time in the city. So it's only an hour and a half, and I would regularly go in Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday for meetings, for work, and so forth, even living out here full time, um, and spend three, four, five days, uh, long weekends out here. Um, so that was a great balance for, for a while. Um, and I saw more and more people doing the same thing. So I saw similar faces every day, taking the, <laughs> the Jitney Ambassador train, whatever it is, into the city, and looking around me saying, well, I'm not the only one who's done this. There are other people, husbands, wives, whatever, spending time in the city being productive and doing whatever business they were doing and then coming out here um, and having the lifestyle really for their kids because it's an amazing lifestyle out here for the children. And that's really the spark for the spur um, yes. was seeing other people on that same life journey that, that I was on, those entrepreneurs um, trying to kind of balance this work life and, and um, you know, move the family home from the city or the city area out to not just a suburb but you know, beyond the suburb, yeah. really. Um, and so the Spur became this community 
and, and, and now a place that we're filming in right now, um, where those like-minded entrepreneurs, whether they're full-time residents out here and they've made the leap, or whether they're people who are still in the city but are spending time out here and are looking for a productive place to work, a, a network uh, of entrepreneurial people who are progressive. Um, innovation is our core. We have a tagline, by innovation only, is our sort of tagline. Mm -hmm. So our membership base is made up of innovators, whether they're thought leaders, you know, entrepreneurs, uh, people who've sold a business, people who are building a business. Um, it's a great melting pot of different people doing exciting things. Um, and for me also, I guess it's, it's part of that give back journey. It's a platform really to give to this community and, and the gift of what I've been lucky enough to, to develop over the last decade or so is, is, is being able to start something from scratch, build it up, see it through, sell it, and go through that, go through that journey and help other people um, go through you know, both the, the good and the bad. And maybe you can prevent some pain by sharing your wisdom. And, and, prevent, <laughs> and prevent some pain. I think one of the, the gentlemen, Sandeep, that you've got coming up later in the series, you know, he's our, our pr uh, classic kind of entrepreneur, startup, first time, yeah. needs a lot of mentorship and guidance, you know, has an idea that he's, he's looking to build out. And so being able to be in the same space and help, help him and others like him um, through our mentorship events that we host regularly here um, is great and, and, and helping them build a, a future and foundation for, the, for their families um, is great to be part of that. So is there anything that's hard or challenging about living and working in the Hamptons? Oh, there's lots of, lots of things. Um, part of it is that you're not, you're, you're kind of a minister without portfolio as I would say it in the sense that you're, you're in between two worlds. You've got the New York City world, the hustle bustle, like I live in New York City and I'm you know, on my game and I'm doing my thing and that's very clear what that dynamic is like. Um, and then out here you have yeah, the local community who've lived and worked here, they may have grown up here and still here or maybe they've, they've moved years ago and from other places. Um, and they're very attuned to what that is and, and they might rarely go to the city or you know, this is their life and they want that quiet life. And, um, and so for us and, and, and many others like us who are out here, it's, it's, we kind of want the best of both worlds and maybe you know, having your cake and eat it is, is not allowed, <laughs> but we're trying to create that solution where we, we do get that tranquility and that, that escape, but still are able to be productive and obviously through technology, laptops, phones and so forth, you're able to still keep in touch with business and people without necessarily sitting in the same room. And so doing more of that type of work from out here and then being able to walk out in the backyard on a phone call and see the sunset or see your kids playing on the trampoline and um, being able, like I do, to pick up my kids. One of the joys that I have is every Friday, it's, it's during the school year, I pick up my kids at three o'clock from school and we go and have ice cream. Every Friday, without a doubt, I can do that. It takes me 15 minutes, I leave the spur, I go there, we have this great experience for an hour, um, then they go off home, I come back to the spur, you know, keep doing some work, but. It's a shorter commute. It's a shorter commute <laughs> than in the city when you're racing around and kids are often yeah. at different schools and you know, you're on the subway and, yeah. and so forth, so. One of the things I find that's hard, I've had company at my house since July 1st. Yep. And I work from home. Yep. And so I get a little jealous for all my friends, like going to the beach and going to, yep. you know, um, the Parish Art Museum yep. and I'm working. Yep. Well, it's hard. <laughs> and I think that's one of the things that I've, I've found difficult is, is for me, the Hamptons used to be an escape. And now, I mean, it's self-inflicted because of the spur, but really now it's not an escape. It is for my kids in a way, it's their lifestyle. For me, it's, it's kind of work now. So I almost have the opposite, that when now I go into the city, it's almost <laughs> the break. And the city is this place yeah. that I can explore and whatever. Yeah. Um, but out here, because of the spur, we're, you know, it's, it's work. And it, yeah. nothing wrong with that. It's, yeah. a, great, it's a great thing. Um, it is a great thing. The spur is great. And I, I'm new to the spur, but I love all the people, including you, that I'm meeting here. Thank you. And uh, it's amazing. So. What else do you do besides, so you're still working on Off The Scale? So yeah, Off The Scale is still an ongoing business. Um, we have a great team who are looking to grow and we've been, healthcare is, a, is, a, is going through a 25 year transformation. It's not an overnight transformation. And that's what I've learned in that business, which was again a learning for myself, having come out of other businesses in fashion and technology and retail where they're moving really quickly. And if you get onto a curve, you can make change in a sh short period of time. Getting into healthcare, completely healthcare the opposite. And education, very slow. Very <laughs> slow, very slow. Huge opportunity, um, but very slow. And so I think that was part of my learning 
was where I thought I'd uh, launching off the scale, I was able to make a big impact in a short period of time. Um, I had to change my expectations to be able to make a big, big impact, but it's going to take time. Um, and so, yes, we're still doing some really interesting things. We have a partnership with Matt Sinai Health System in the New York area, and we're working closely with them on a, on a series of uh, initiatives in our program and so forth. Um, and it has huge opportunity, but at the same time, it, it moves slowly. And because I'm one of those entrepreneurs that I can't, I can't just sit back and wait for it to happen. I have to keep you know, building and working. Um, and so that's kind of the spur is partly um, obviously now what I'm focused on and building that brand. We have a second location now in East Hampton and we're looking at other markets around the country as to take this model that we're, we're replicating to help other markets solve the same problem. Um, Just so. in the US or worldwide? Well, I think the opportunity is a global opportunity yeah. in the sense there are what I would call second home markets uh, where people are spending some of their time, some of their lifestyle time, could be a day week, two days a week, a month, a year, whatever, um, and they're around the world. Um, and you're near a city hub and people want to mm -hmm. kind of flip-flop their lives. And I think especially people in my category or age group, which has sort of got young families and they're probably living in a small-ish environment in that city environment and they're lucky enough to have a second home environment who wouldn't want to spend more time in that, in that larger second home environment. Um, and so that's, uh, to me, a global phenomenon. And if we can be the business and brand at the center of that, helping make those transitions happen. In fact, we have an event next Thursday at Spur East specifically on that, uh, all about transitioning from Manhattan to the Hamptons. Um, and we have some of the local schools talking and the local hospital really trying to t bring down the fear factor of making that change because it is a big change. It is a big change. Um, and a lot of people have fear, well, what am I going to do? What's a day in the life like or a year in the life like? Um, how am I going to make money? Um, and so hopefully we'll be able to to help them lower that barrier and bring some more of those people around year round because I think that's part of what's, what is one of the struggles about being in a resort town is it's cyclical. You have very peaky peaks and troughs. So right now we're in the middle of it. We're in the middle of July, the busiest time of the year, lots of traffic and, and uh, hard to get into a restaurant and all those great things. Um, but then November, December, January, February roll around and it's quieter, which is great. Um, but also you can feel disconnected from that, from what's going on. Um, and so for us and the Spur and our members, what we're trying to say is, hey, don't just come here for a week here and a week there and the summer here. Truly come here, move here, bring your families here, bring your life here. And you can still go to the city on a regular basis, um, but be here year round and really help support the community, be part of the community year round. Um, that should bring jobs and tax revenue and, and help the schools continue to grow instead of declining. The whole of Long Island is declining. Uh, there's a population flight um, over the last five-ish, 10 years because it's becoming more and more expensive. And so people who've lived here for 10, 20, 30 years are taking the opportunity to sell their home and their land and move to North Carolina or Atlanta or wherever, down south, maybe better weather, a lot less expensive. Um, and we don't want this place to become a ghost town. Yes. It needs to be an all year round, vibrant, vibrant place, which it is, yes. but there's definitely signs that that's changing. Yeah. Well, and I so think you're helping with all your events and your mission. And uh, I'm someone who lives here year round and figured it out. And I'd love to have more people around here uh, working and living and economic yep. development for everyone. Yep. Um, so you mentor people, you have off the scale, you yep. have the spur. Yep. Uh, in my language, I call you a linker. You're, so you're doing many things. Yes. So as someone that does many things, what tips do you have for people who want to do many things? How do you figure that out? Yeah, that's one of life's challenges is somebody, I guess I'll call myself a linker then, I'll <laughs> use your language. As a linker, um, you're drawn to new ideas, you're drawn to connecting people, you see very quickly the connecting the dots between an idea that somebody has and maybe somebody you met last week at a dinner party and then maybe there's a vendor who could help and, and you want to just naturally connect those things together and so uh, you have to be very disciplined otherwise you can just be crazy in terms of your, your day and your flow. We're already in an ADD society where we're kind of just jumping yeah. all the time. Um, and so discipline is part of it, setting very tangible goals on a regular basis, weekly, quarterly, whatever makes sense for the business, and making sure you give each opportunity its time and recognize 
Um, it's hard to have all the ideas at the same time. So businesses go through different growth phases, right? There's the idea phase, piece of paper ideas, brainstorming. There's then the sort of operational phase where you're starting to, you've got some revenues, you've got some clients, you're looking to scale a little bit. Then there's either the flat line company that needs a bit of extra juice or twisting or pivoting. And then you've got the transition phase where you're starting to sell or sort of exit and so forth. And so I think the key for linking is to have a mix of those because if they're all in one kind of status, um, it can get a little bit crazy. I so. think from the outside looking in, sometimes we think these, as a linker, we think people are chaotic, but in fact, to get a lot done, you have to be very structured. Yeah. And the relationships in one really help the other. Yeah. It's, uh, so when you're meeting investors for a certain business, those could be investors for other businesses. Uh, when you're doing deals with certain companies, those could also be interesting for others. So when you're in the middle of that and making those connections, um, scale helps. Um, scale of relationships, mm -hmm. scale of that network helps. And so you have to be, but yeah, it is a little bit manic sometimes. <laughs> I mean, we're doing five events today and going to five different places in one day. It's 105 degrees out right now um, because we're connected to all these different people and we're linking them together and helping, to, yeah. helping them to grow. So it's a, it's a blessing and a curse at the same time. I think we can bring it back to, and you're, this is your passion and you're personally interested in all of it, yeah. and which helps a lot. I, well, I, you can't do it without that. If you're yeah. not, I'm not waking up every day thinking, well, this day I'm going to make X amount of money to do this, or I'm going to get a pat on the back to do this, or whatever. It is, you know, hopefully all of that comes, and, and success, whatever success means, whether it's financial, personal, or emotional, um, but you have to do it because it's passionate, and people are drawn to different things. And uh, this is what I've, this is kind of who I am. I've realized it's who I am. And although some people in my, my, my family, my parents might wish I had a different DNA and I was sort of, you know, just doing the nine to five and, and so forth, it's just not who I am. So I'd rather be, um, you know, passionate, driven, and excited every day about what I'm doing, regardless of the financial rewards to some degree. Obviously, you have to provide for, you know, a family and so forth, but. Um, than just be in that, in that treadmill of life that unfortunately so many people find themselves in, often no fault of their own, just they either don't know, you know another way or they, you know, they haven't been exposed to it and so forth. And hopefully maybe this video series um, you know, and, and the work that you're doing helps, helps yeah. to give people that aha moment or that extra like, no, I can do that. I yeah. see a little bit of myself in, in what he or she is saying. So. Thank you very much for your story and sharing your beautiful dream with us. It's been a pleasure. Thank you so much. Thank you. You're welcome.